Dr. Spear. Take it away. Tell us about Iron Steel. Yes. Okay, great. Well, it's, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, it's back home for me. I, I was brought up here and worked here and went to school here. Um, so this presentation about um, steel products is, is based um, a little bit on a, um, the 2018 AIST Keith Brimicombe uh, lecture. I've made some changes for this audience um, and have a little bit of things here in case some AIST members um, see it later on. Um, and I thought I would uh, just start by uh, mentioning something about Keith Brimicombe. Um, I think there's a, a, a TMS and an ISS published a book about um, Keith. He was president of um, ISS, president of TMS, a distinguished member of AIST, trustee of AME, and, um, and he was president-elect designate of AIME when, um, when he passed away, uh, you know, prematurely. So when you think about iron and steel technology, there's an image in your mind right now, and it's probably different for each of you. Um, so, so what is that image? Um, so I'm going to show you some photographs, and we'll see if any of those images correspond. Um, so this one's for the SME guys. So we have iron ore. Um, the blast furnace. Um, so what happens in the blast furnace is we take that iron ore, react it with carbon associated with coal or coke, and uh, reduce the iron. We generate, uh, that's where our carbon dioxide is generated in the steel making process. And there's a lot of technology development going on now um, to decarbonize steel production. Um, but that uh, pig iron that comes out of the blast furnace then is refined uh, with oxygen steel making. Um, and then uh, you might produce steel in a different fashion um, rather than using iron ore, using scrap uh, recycling. And the, the US has a very high proportion of um, scrap recycling. And the scrap would be remelted in an electric arc furnace. Um, and then the liquid steel is cast into different forms. This is a slab um, that would be rolled into a flat rolled product. Um, so this here the slab is coming out of a reheat furnace. Um, so the temperature is controlled at an elevated temperature for hot rolling. Um, so here is hot rolling um, in a um, looks like six stand um, finishing mill, hot strip mill, um, producing a hot rolled sheet that gets uh, wound into a coil and then slow cooled. Um, here's a plate being rolled on a reversing um, mill. Um, so um, individual plate not wound into coil form. Um, you might roll long products, so bar shapes, uh, wire rods that are here being uh, controlled cooled to um, control the microstructure um, for, for example, for wire drawing. Um, those hot rolled sheet coils are often cold rolled to thinner gauges with better surface quality that might go onto the outside of your automobile, for example. Um, they're very hard after cold rolling. Um, they have to be annealed because they're also not very formable after cold rolling. Um, so here's a um, so-called batch annealing step. So you see three um, cold rolled coils. You can see they have nice um, surface finish. Um, so the cold rolled uh, coils are stacked. There's a furnace cover that's put over the top, and then they're heated up um, slowly um, to recrystallize the ferrite in a controlled atmosphere to maintain the surface quality, and then they're cooled back to room temperature. Um, now, here we talked about uh, zinc this morning. Um, this is probably the biggest application of zinc is for corrosion uh, resistant sheet steel. Um, if you remember back to the cars that you grew up with that rusted out, well, the zinc coated steels that we use today are much more corrosion resistant. And, and so here the, the sheet has been annealed um, and it comes out of the annealing process and goes right into a liquid zinc pot. Um, and so now the, the strip is coming out of the liquid zinc, it's going up, um, it's being solidified, but it's kind of shiny here. Um, if you see it in the, the middle of the image, um, so it's still liquid at that point. Um, 
And then the, the coils uh, would be uh, maybe rolled again to control the surface finish and wrapped and shipped off to the customers. Um, so uh, did you find something that matched one of the images you had about iron and steel technology? Okay, great. Um, so, so with that, um, I want to switch gears a little bit, and we're going um, we're gonna to think differently about iron and steel um, technology. I'm going to show you some more images quickly. Um, I have a lot of them, and we're going to go fast. Um, so let's think about how humanity uses our technology, um, not the production technology. Um, so iconic bridges. Right? That bridge was actually constructed, um, I think designed and constructed by Bethlehem Steel, Steel Fabrication Division. Um, tall building construction um, and smaller building construction. Um, so Kevin, is this where your office is? Okay, the US Steel, yep. uh, which floor? 18. 18th floor. So uh, UPMC, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, bought the US Steel building and so they put a new name on it. Um, it has special steel on the outside, um, and it's called weathering steel. You see these rusty looking steel structures um, when you're driving around, that's called weathering steel. It's a special composition. Um, early in its life, it develops uh, an oxide on the surface that's protective, right? So it's an adherent oxide and it provides um, long atmospheric corrosion resistance without having to be painted um, periodically. So it's intentionally rusty looking. Um, steel, tin, quote, so-called tin mill products. Um, so thin sheet for uh, food cans, pet food cans. Um, you see aerosol spray cans here, uh, oil filters, uh, energy storage. Um, again, these iconic landscapes, this is Shanghai in China. You see some steel construction going on in the background uh, of that image, but this is all enabled by, um, by structural steels. Singapore, um, remember the bird's nest stadium from Beijing in China? Um, those are four inch plates that are welded into those um, structural sections for the bird's nest. Um, highway guardrails to protect you when you're not paying attention. Um, defense applications, Navy shipbuilding, um, barges, you see bridge in the background, oil tanker, automobile, again, if you're not paying attention, um, the high strength wires in your steel belted radial tires, um, gears and bearings, springs, pipelines, agricultural equipment, mining and construction equipment, aircraft landing gear, right, rail cars and tank cars, um, steel building construction. Um, I have a steel garage door on my house and an entry door in front. Right? Most people probably don't even think about that. Um, steel rail uh, for transportation. Um, look at that beautiful landscape <laughs> of steel structures. A uh, concrete reinforcing bar. Uh, food preparation equipment, right? If you go to the fast food restaurant, it's uh, stainless steel all over the place. Uh, poles and towers. Um, enabling all sorts of communication technology, wind towers, wind turbines. Um, these are the bearings on top of the uh, wind tower. Um, this one connects the blades. Um, there are also um, very demanding gear and bearing applications um, in the generator on top of the tower that converts the mechanical electricity, uh, mechanical energy into electricity. So, so imagine your world without steel, right? It's, it's everywhere, right? You're probably sitting, being supported in your seat right now um, by steel. Um, so steel technology is inspiring, right? And, and so don't forget that. Um, now, we can't take that product 
performance for granted or the designs with steel, um, for that matter. Occasionally things happen. Um, and you know, we don't want to be the engineers involved in these, um, these examples, but maybe you remember the I-35 um, bridge in Minneapolis. It's the busiest bridge in Minnesota and it fell into the Mississippi in 2007. Uh, maybe you remember that crane that came down in New York City in 2015. Um, you know, this is not such an effective wind tower anymore. Um, you know, that's what happens if you have a bearing failure um, in a wind tower. You know, so the, uh, the bearings are very, uh, that's a very demanding application um, for steel and critical. And AIST um, and AIME before that um, are really important to the steel development community. Um, just as an example, I show you conference proceedings from a whole series of um, symposia that AIST sponsored in different aspects of ferrous product metallurgy. There was another one in, uh, that was held virtually in the summer of 2021, and there's some others going forward. Um, so I want to talk a little bit uh, more about the continuing development of modern steel products, um, and I'll highlight a few things. Um, but I, I want to include some history here as well, so probably more history, um, and linkages with both AIST and AIME. Um, so steel's, right, you can think of steel development going back to the Iron Age, really, um, but we're going to start at 1853 for this story, um, some early product development. So 1853, James Horsfall, um, who's a wire drawer from Birmingham in England, invented um, the patenting process for steel wire, eutectoid steel wire. And in the background, this is the microstructure with a modern field emission scanning electron microscope, lamellar perlite for all of those of you who have studied uh, metallurgy a little bit. Um, but you could imagine in 1853, they didn't have the capability to really study the microstructure and understand the science that we do today. Um, so, so it's amazing to have this kind of development um, but that patenting process, which is still in use today, um, was used at the time for improved piano wire, um, needles and fish hooks, right? We think those, of those as mundane applications, but they were, um, they were particularly important. And, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, helped enable the laying of the transatlantic cable. Um, in 1866, there was 30,000 miles um, of high strength steel wire. Um, in that cable, and the, the image in the background is, a, um, is an engraving showing the laying of the transatlantic um, telegraph cable. Um, so three years later, um, after the invention of wire patenting, um, is when Henry Bessemer um, invented the Bessemer process, um, which really enabled um, mass production of raw steel. Um, and so a very important development that affected um, the industrial world. Um, in the US, uh, Robert Woolson Hunt um, ran the first US Bessemer Works, which was in Michigan, started in 1866. Um, and he was the 1883 AIME president. Um, he also received the Fritz Medal in 1912, and I'll come back and talk a little bit about the Fritz Medal um, in a few minutes. Um, but the, uh, he's one of the namesakes of the AIST Hunt Kelly Outstanding Paper Award, which was really a, a top technical honor um, from, from AIST. Um, and uh, so his legacy is carried on. Um, so if we, if we look at the, the origin of AIST, um, we go, our roots go back in two directions. So uh, with the beginning of eight, uh, AIME in 1871, then the Iron and Steel Division in 1928, uh, and ISS, the Iron and Steel Society in 1974, um, there was a parallel development of the Association of Iron and Steel Engineers who have their own uh, legacy and history starting in 1907, and those two uh, organizations uh, joined together and became AIST. Um, so AIST now, as, as everyone in this audience knows, is, is part of AIME and the four uh, great member societies that we have. Um, we did 
update the logo. Was that 2019, Michelle, about? Um, so you see the old and the new logos. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, Kevin Zeke, so the AIST uh, member trustee um, of AST and, and taking over as uh, president of AIME. It's been great to work with you um, uh, with that organization um, while I was involved with AIME. So, um, so moving forward, um, Alexander Lyman Holly, um, he owned the rights in the US to the Bessemer process and, um, and was involved installing and modifying the technology of the uh, Bessemer converters in the US, including Pennsylvania that I'll talk about. Um, and Holly was the 1875, so, so very early in AIME's history, uh, president. And there's a statue of him uh, that I believe stands today in New York City in Washington Square Park. Um, now, moving on to Bessemer Steel, the first um, order for steel rails in the US was produced in a Bessemer converter um, at the Pennsylvania Steel Company in Steelton, Pennsylvania. So that's near Harrisburg. It's very close to Three Mile Island, actually, um, in 1867. Um, the Pennsylvania Steel Company became later part of Bethlehem Steel um, and then is now part of Cleveland Cliffs. They make rail there um, to this day. Um, the rail ultimate was rolled at the Cambria Works um, in Johnstown, which again became part of uh, Bethlehem Steel. Uh, and this is a, a photograph um, from around 1880 of the um, Steelton Bessemer in operation. Um, so the, the first converter in Steelton, 1867, by 1882, there were 35 converters um, operating in the US. And here you can see that production was between seven and eight million tons a year by 1900. Um, and 85% of Bessemer steel produced in the US went into the production of rail. Um, and if you think about it, so this is the rail network in the US in 1890. Um, and so, so in, in, I think in a real sense, you could, you could really see that steel technology really built America, right? Opened up the West, um, transportation infrastructure. Um, and that brings me to John Fritz. Um, I think George mentioned uh, this morning that you know, he's referred to sometimes as the father of the US steel industry. Um, he was 1894 AIME president. On the, on the right side here, um, you see a photograph from 1909 of um, John Fritz in the Fritz Engineering Laboratory, which is basically across the street in that direction um, and still stands today. Um, and one of Fritz's, he, he's known for a number of technology developments and um, just an amazing engineer, I think. Um, but one of his important developments was the three high rolling mill. Um, so the three high rolling mill is, is pictured um, on the left here. Um, and what the rolling mill does that's in the, the top slab is sort of schematically being reduced in thickness as it goes through the rolling mill. And then it can be fed um, through the bottom gap um, and rolled in the other direction. So you can do, right, you can roll in both directions without having to carry the rail from one side of the mill to take another rolling pass. Um, and so that development of the three high rolling mill allowed much more um, efficient, but also um, easier rail rolling production because you could roll at higher temperatures. Um, deformation is easy. The quality of the rails that were rolled were easier. Uh, were better, and, and that was an important development um, in rail steel production. Um, now, Fritz was also involved in the uh, production of this forging that I show in the upper, upper right. Um, that was produced um, a few blocks from here for the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. It's, it was, I believe, the largest forging that had been produced in the world. Um, there was a very um, large forge that was set up for Navy forgings here in Bethlehem. 
Um, and I think that that forging was also considered the first alloy steel development in the US. Um, and uh, as you can tell from the image, that Ferris wheel in Chicago was uh, 264 feet tall. So the Fritz Award that I mentioned earlier um, is sometimes considered the Nobel Prize of Engineering. Now there's, there's some other uh, prizes that engineers, uh, engineering organizations like the National Academy give. And so, um, so there might be some uh, question of the top engineering awards these days, but you can see some of the winners. So um, when the award was established, Fritz was the first winner, and then um, the award wasn't given for a couple of years, and then you can see Lord Kelvin, Westinghouse, Alexander Graham Bell, Thomas Edison were um, early Fritz Award winners. Um, and Hunt won the Fritz Award in 1912, and I, I show here um, in 1917 Henry Marion Howe um, won the Fritz Award. He was also AIME president in 1893. Um, and uh, AIST has a, an award lecture, the, the Howe uh, Memorial Award Lecture. Um, so the John Fritz Medal is very prestigious. And uh, just in the last year or so, AIME has taken that over with um, SME managing it and you know, I'm looking forward to the announcement of the first winner. Um, the committee um, is, is really working to try to give this award the same kind of stature um, that it had in the early 1900s. Um, you heard that Herbert Hoover was AIME president in 1920 before he was US president. He also received the Fritz Medal in 1929 and he acknowledged that I think as one of his favorite awards because it was given um, by his professional colleagues. Now, getting back to steel development a little bit, alloying is a key, right? We make recipes, so uh, we mix alloying elements together and then we control processing um, in order to create um, new product creations. Um, and er in the early 1900s, um, vanadium was developed and in, in vanadium steels were, were sort of initially developed in France and England. Um, and the Ford Motor Company, though, did a lot of development work on high strength um, vanadium added steels. Uh, and in 2008, Popular Mechanics named um, vanadium high strength steels as one of the top 10 Model T technology developments um, that mattered um, 100 years later. Um, also in the, in the alloying world, you see here on the left, an advertisement for molybdenum steel, the American super steel for the lightweight car. That was in 1920. Um, that advertisement could have been in 2020. Um, high strength steel for automotive light, light weighting um, is still a very important area. Um, Climax molybdenum developed the chrome moly or chromium molybdenum steels in about 1920. That's when the Climax mine opened in Colorado. They just celebrated their 100th anniversary, um, a climax part of Freeport MacMoran. Um, now, we don't have time to talk about too many recent um, steel product developments, but things are moving faster than ever, and it's um, just as important um, as ever. Uh, line pipe steels have progressed over the years. So the next slide I have shows you the, the strength level of um, steel is used in line pipe as a function of time um, up to about 2010. Um, and you can see starting at uh, you know, 36 or 42 KSI yield strength, um, line pipes now are you know, X65, X70. Um, there's some X80 in use. Um, there's X100 and X120 that have been developed. I think there's a little bit of experimental use of X100. So, so the progress of technology um, over time just doesn't stop. Um, and I, I think you'll see some of this continue. So uh, this comes from a, a paper that you might be interested in, a half century of evolution of high strength line pipe. Um, automotive steel development is extremely critical. The automotive industry is an early adopter of materials technologies. They, they move um, actually very quickly. Um, and in the automotive development area, we're looking for higher strength steels. Um, 
for mass reduction of the vehicle, for improved fuel economy, reduced CO2 emissions. Um, you, have to, you have to maintain occupant passenger safety in a collision, if you saw the photograph that I showed. Um, you have to maintain rigidity of the structure, so that requires improved designs as well. And this is a microstructure um, of a first generation so-called advanced high strength steel. Um, it's called the dual phase steel, so it's a mixture um, for the metallurgists of ferrite and martensite. Um, and you know, those steels were developed in around the 1970s. And they were really implemented at large scale more in the early 2000s. So they're, they're very important today. You're driving them in your vehicles. Um, it did take a while, though, to get them into production. We have to move a lot faster um, today. Uh, this, um, this graph was uh, prepared by the steel industry in around 2005. Um, it's called the banana diagram because of the sort of general shape. And there are... Um, there are a whole variety of different steels labeled here, and I'm not going to talk about them in um, detail. Um, but you can see there's a trade-off here between, on the bottom, the strength, um, and on the left-hand axis, the elongation or the right, the elongation to fracture and a tension test, or you could think of that as the formability of the steel. So there's a trade-off between strength and formability. Um, and the industry was really looking to fill this red circle called the future opportunity for third generation advanced high strength steels. And, and so, you know, over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, there's been a lot of success of creating products that have better combinations of strength and formability. And so that future is now. Those third generation steels are being implemented um, today on vehicles. Um, and th this is one if I can control the computer. Um, this is one example of a third generation advanced high strength steel. Um, there's a lot of interesting science around these kinds of products, um, but I'm, I'm not really gonna talk about that today. Um, but this is a, a mixture. Um, so this is a high magnification microstructure. This is a mixture of a hard martensite phase um, and austenite, um, which is a face-centered cubic structure of iron that usually exists at high temperature, uh, but can be stabilized. Um, and so here there's some tricks that are being used with alloying and processing to stabilize the austenite to room temperature. Um, and in these multi-phase steels, um, the austenite undergoes a transformation um, during deformation. It's called transformation-induced plasticity. Um, and that phase transformation during deformation gives a better combination of strength and formability. Um, and I, I can show you the uh, example of that, um, that deformation-induced phase transformation. This, is a, this was a flat piece of um, austenitic stainless steel. So because of the high alloy content of stainless steel, the austenite was stable at room temperature or metastable. Um, and then it was formed into this sort of dome laboratory test specimen. Um, and the austenite phase is, is not ferromagnetic, like you're accustomed to for steel, so this is a magnet, right? And the magnet doesn't stick um, to the steel. Um, but where it's been deformed, the austenite transformed to the ferromagnetic um, martensite phase, and um, the magnet does stick. So you have this, um, this change in crystal structure that occurs um, with deformation, and that's really responsible for the behavior of these next generation advanced high strength steels that are being produced by industry. Um, and just sort of contrasting these, these different microstructures um, that, I, that I showed you in this presentation, right? Um, fine perlite on the, on the left. Um, those are carbides, the white stuff, um, not austenite. Um, but so steel product development takes the alloy recipes and the processing and the understanding of how the microstructure changes um, and controls uh, the microstructure to create these desired um, property characteristics for different applications. Um, so I think I said this, uh, these next generation automotive steels are enabled by new processing concepts 
um, not just allying. Um, and you saw maybe the theme of what I've talked about so far, you saw John Fritz develop the processing that made rail production um, successful uh, in the USA. So, so product development and process development go hand in hand. And that was a real theme of, of Keith Brimacombe's life. He was really a process developer, but he understood um, the relationship between the two. Um, so uh, General Motors in, in China with um, Bao Steel is really the, the first company that was an early adopter of these next generation high strength steels. Um, going from concept in 2003 um, to production in 2010, so much faster than the adoption of dual phase steels. Um, so these steels are in the marketplace. Um, this is a press release from 2020 in November, um, Ford's hot new Bronco. Um, what makes the material unique is we use a proprietary chemistry and quench and partition technology. That's right. Um, that's a special heat treatment to create um, these martensite austenite microstructures. And uh, when you look at your new car, you don't see the technology that's embedded in the materials, but it's there and it's advancing um, all the time. Um, and, and you can see the, the steel industry is investing in these technologies. Um, so these are press releases from um, AK Steel, which is now um, part of uh, Cleveland Cliffs, and US Steel, and Nucor, and ArcelorMittal, Nippon Sumitomo in Alabama. So all of these companies are investing hundreds of millions of dollars um, in being able to create um, new products for the world. Um, so many challenges remain. The work isn't finished. Um, every time there's a new um, opportunity, there are new challenges as well. And some of the new alloys that are being produced um, are experiencing some new mechanisms um, during spot welding when there's zinc on top of the steel and it's spot welded, the zinc uh, penetrates the grain boundaries of the high temperature and creates um, cracks in the weld. So the industry has really been working um, to mitigate uh, those problems. And I think um, there's been a lot of progress in that respect. Um, so to conclude my remarks today, um, steel product development has enabled society. Um, we take it for granted, but it's there in everything that we do. Um, and this is an exciting time. Steel, steel products are advancing faster than ever today. Um, there's a lot of work going on. And so um, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today to um, talk to you about it. And I'm, I'm thanking the, uh, uh, the sponsor companies of our program in Colorado that, that allowed me to come here today. So, um, so thank you and congratulations, uh, AIME. First, I want to thank the steel industry for finding a use for Mother Yeah. <laughs> because they didn't know what to do with it until Lolly Steel came along. Second, I know you started in the 1800s, but can you talk a little bit about the Vasquez steel back in you know, the early times as to what type of steel that was and why it made it so special? Yeah, I'm not really an expert in Damascus steel, uh, Damascus steel, but you know we have students that actually play around with that stuff. So different compositions, um, you know that that are forged in a way that create um, variation in the composition, and then um, that variation, you know, creates some artistic qualities uh, that you can see. But but I think the steels also had very sharp edges and were effective for sword production as well. Uh, but I don't know, maybe somebody in the audience knows more about Damascus steel than I do. Come on. So, so one area that is uh, very interesting is a lot of stuff is these nanomaterials. 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 Yeah. Uh, people should perhaps collaborate more uh, in terms of society and so on. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's a huge field and, uh, uh, I mean, you know, TMS probably considers themselves uh, um, the group that houses that technology, but, um, you know, nanotechnology is probably embedded in some way in just about every materials development that you could think of. 
Um, it was the original map, which are relying on nanocell structures right. everything you just showed. Yeah. Um, so we, so um, I don't know if that was a question or a suggestion. Yeah. Yes. Just to follow on that point, TMS and AIST have been working together with our Material Science and Technology Conference, which is mm -hmm. held two weeks from now in Columbus. And we're hopeful, if all goes well, that next year we will bring a nanotechnology exhibit to the conference, to bring companies in who specialize in nanotechnologies to look for those interdependencies. You're great. Yeah, John, I have a question. My dad was a member of the American Iron and Steel Institute. How does that relate to AIST? Is that a so that's a tr that's a sort of trade association. Um, so with corporate members, and AIST is a technical organization with individual members. Okay. Um, and so you know, I think AIS AIS I used to have more technical content, but also. Um, the lobbying activity that AIST doesn't get involved in, and then um, a lot of market development programs, the, the Auto Steel Partnership um, in Detroit came out of AISI. I don't know, Ron, if you want to say anything more about AISI. No, I think that, that sums it up. We can talk more over dinner if you'd like. Yeah, okay. But, yeah, I think like many of our organizations, SPE, is, uh, there are Washington-based trade associations that look to uh, ensure level playing fields on trade-related issues, public advocacy, market development. Um, but when it comes to the technology, most of those areas have been acceded to groups like ours. Okay. Great. Um, and th they work together. I know that because they've been doing it recently. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you, John.